everyone. We have a packed room that really goes to the heart of the matter that this is probably one of the most important sessions in Davos. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome to our session, Securing Europe. I'm Francine Lacqua from Bloomberg TV. And however the war unfolds, of course, Russia's invasion has upended European defense policy, probably for the longer term. But the war in Ukraine has also united the European Union around this common threat while shattering the security order that helped Europe to prosper in the last couple of decades. Now, in the next 45 minutes, we'll try to address what uh, steps Europe needs to take to develop into a viable security player in this radical change context. From Berlin to London to Baltic capitals like Tallinn, the metrics, of course, of defending Europe are changing. They've been torn up. A large-scale war is no longer unthinkable, and nations are reconsidering what they spend, what they buy, and also how they would need to fight. Now, a reminder that you can ask questions for the session. It's Q&A through the Slido. I've been reminded that it's slido.com. Hashtag securing Europe, or there's also a QR code that should show up somewhere where you crash. There you go. That's a QR code on the right where you can just lock it in and send some questions. Now, before we get to an all star panel or, that are sitting here with me, let's go straight to Andrei Yermak. He's the head of the presidential administration of Ukraine, and he's joining us from Kyiv. So, sir, thank you so much for joining us and for being here with us today. Mr. Yermak, where are we militarily in this war today, and how would you define victory? Uh, dear Ms. Uh, Ms. Lakwa, dear panelists, dear guests, thank you for the honor of the opening this meeting. It's dedicated to one of the most uh, pressing issues in today's world. Uh, this panel is focused on securing Europe. I'm here and an, an, an official uh, Ukrainian representative. No more doubts, obviously, Ukraine is Europe. Shame it took eight years for Europeans to realize it. In those eight, eight years, the world order shattered, the political map was legally changed. Tens of thousands of the people died, and millions more had to escape. Whoever escaped, uh, despite all the crimes Russia soldier committed in Bucha, Mariupol, Chernigov, and dozens of other locations. We keep hearing calls for capitulation for the sake of the peace in Europe. Some of our partners are still suggesting us to give into aggressors to save lives. Negotiations, also called territorial disputes, are proposed. How can uh, one believe it when Russia showed or tried intention to destroy Ukraine? How can one hope for while Russian opinions leaders are calling Ukrainians, us, the wrong Russians? How can one expect it given the numerous testimonies of the act of genocide against Ukraine's committed by Russian troops? Ukraine does not have any territorial dispute with Russia. Russia has simply occupied and tried to annex Ukrainian territories illegally, absolutely. More than uh, anyone, we strive a balanced and traditional re dialogue. However, Russian political culture does not provide uh, for a dialogue like the equal terms. Its basis its dictation and languages of the brute force. More than one in one is uh, one the world the seek peace, but it should be just. Our sovereignty and territorial integrity are not subject of the compromise. We are dealing with the ideologies and practices terribly alike the worst distro ships and the, the last century. History teach us that pacific and aggressors is futile. They always take peacefulness for the weakness. They demand more with every next concession. Therefore, there is only one way to prevent the war in Ukraine from escalating into continental and even world war. Help Ukraine win. Now you don't have 
to wage this war. Just help us to do it. <clears throat> Otherwise, you have to, you have sent your troops to the battles. Helping Ukraine is a way to resolve the construction between value policy and real politics. This is a way to send a clear signal to potential aggressor in the future. Their actions will not uh, will, will not go to unfinished. So Ukraine immediate goal to stop Russia brutal aggression and ensures the complete withdrawal of these troops from our lands. Then we must find a reliable way to deter Russian from repeating aggression in the future. But the world order is nearly wrecked and shattered. Russian's presence in the United Nations is semi-paralyzed with the Russian presence in the Security Council. The OCE has lost its recent data. NATO is only institution capable of the providing a reliable security umbrella to its members. But some of the island nations still allow Russia to veto Ukraine's accession. So we have to take alternative path. Today, I am glad here in Davos to announce that together with the former NATO Secretary General, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, we are establishing an international advisory working group. Its aim is to make some recommendation for a reliable and efficient security guarantees for Ukraine. Leading figures from security, policy, and diplomacy, as well as a scientist, will be invited to join and they contribute. We look forward to involving the friends of Ukraine who can offer their experience and their expertise to efficiently implement the initiative. Our goal is to stop history from repeating and prepare the future for the sovereign and free Ukraine. Given the Budapest Memorandum experience, we assume that the future agreements should contain security guarantees, not insurance. And this is very important. No third party security obligations can fully substitute for Ukraine, developing and sustaining its own strong defense capabilities. So the first block of the security guarantees, it's related to enhancing Ukrainian ability to resist aggression. To ensure Ukraine's defense capabilities, the guarantor states should provide our armed force with the modern conventional weapons and military equipment. No restrictions, nor political motivated bars. We need weapons to defense, only to defense. We must be able to withstand any aggressions. I want to say you that since February 24, nearly 700 Ukrainian children have been killed touched, raped, and wounded by Russian troops. Who's are we know for sure, so we told probably much higher. Over 230,000 kids, they're deported to Russia. They must be able to protect our children. They have the right to live in this safe country. And we are to ensure that the right as a part of our commitment partners could help us in the fields of intelligence sharing information, security, cyber security, maritime security. We believe that rapid recovery of defense potential of Ukraine is one of the important factors in the preventing the new possible aggression. Russia has badly damaged our economy. And we can't put enough money into defense in the coming years. So we'll need annual financial help. 
for reconstruction purposes, as well as we financing the security and defense. The next block of the security guarantees in sections, they are an effective tools for the stopping Russian aggressions today and deterring in the future. The current sanctions should last at the very least until complete withdrawal of the Russian troops from Ukraine. Their mitigation and lifting should be agreed with the government of Ukraine. We should consider the risk of restoring Russian military technical potential. They also believe that guarantees of the imposition of the preventing sanction should be also provided in case of real threat to our state. And of course, in the event of the aggression, immediate and coordinated sanctions should be provided. The final block of the security guarantees, it's related to political and diplomatic support of Ukraine. In bending Ukraine in the multilateral diplomatic uh, process would improve our integration in the international community. First of all, I mean it's about Ukraine G uh, joining the European Union as soon as possible. I need to emphasize, we don't think we so-called alternative formats of the integration are acceptable here. Ukraine also support the establishment of the coalition of the responsible states, like the friends of Ukraine, <coughs> or until war coalition, U24, which be ready to effectively respond to the of violations of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within 24 hours. This means providing the necessary military and military technical, financial, and humanitarian aid, as well as imposing sanctions against the aggressor's country within 24 hours. When it comes to security guarantees for ourselves, we are not asking. We are offer our partners to invest to common security. First, European. But in the future, the system could become the base of new global security architecture. Thank you very much for your time. And now the pleasure I give the floor to Ms. Latva. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Yermak, thank you. Just a quick... <laughs> Mr. Yermak, just a very quick follow-up before we go to the panel. So victory, I, I think you were clear at the beginning, but victory in your eyes is not a full ceasefire. It's Russian troops leaving Ukrainian territory full stop. Is that right? Is that how you would describe victory? Uh, you see, we are not aggressive state. We are only defending. So restoring our sovereignty and territorial integrity and make our people safe is uh, it's real our immediate priority. Uh, now I think it's uh, meantime the aggressor must pay the price of their choice. And of course, we need to make everything that Russia will not be able to attack us again. And of course, uh, the, for us, it's, uh, the victory, it's not just ceasefire. It's uh, <clears throat> our people paid the highest price. <coughs> it's the life of the, our people hundreds of our people. And of course, we are waiting for our victory and I am absolutely sure that we win. And this win will be not only a victory of Ukraine, it will be victory of all democracy and free world. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Yermak. I would love to get to our panel um, straight away. Alexander de Croo, the Prime Minister of Belgium, Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General of NATO, Kaya Ollengren, the Minister of Defense of the Netherlands, and Stevo Penderovsky, President of North Macedonia. So thank you all 
for joining us. Secretary General, let's start with you. How do you see NATO getting involved in this conflict, if at all? Well, NATO has two tasks when it comes to the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, the first is to uh, support Ukraine. And I am so impressed by the courage of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian armed forces, and the Ukrainian political uh, leadership. And we all have a responsibility to support them in their fight, uh, to help them to uphold the right for self-defense. And actually, NATO allies have supported Ukraine uh, for many years, since 2014, uh, helped to train the thousands of Ukrainian uh, troops, and especially the United States, the United Kingdom, um, Canada, and also Turkey has provided also critical equipment. <laughs> And after the invasion, uh, all the NATO, NATO allies stepped up and many other partners also started to provide uh, support. Uh, that's our first uh, responsibility, is to support Ukraine, uh, because this matters also for our security. But the second responsibility and our core task is, of course, to protect all NATO allies. Uh, so, uh, uh, so it is important to prevent this conflict from escalating to a full-scale war between Russia and uh, NATO. Uh, then we'll see even more death, more destruction, um, more damage uh, than what we see today in Ukraine. So this dual task of support, but not uh, uh, do anything that can escalate the conflict, <coughs> is the challenge for NATO. And we do that partly by making it clear that we support Ukraine, but NATO will not be part of the conflict, will not send NATO troops into Ukraine. Second, we have, of course, increased our military presence in the eastern part of the lines. Now we have 40,000 troops under NATO command. Uh, we have uh, more naval and, uh, and uh, air capabilities, uh, especially in the eastern part of the lines. And um, uh, we have uh, more than 100,000 troops on high, heightened alert. This is to send a very clear message to Moscow uh, and leave no room for miscalculation or misunderstanding. An attack on one NATO ally will trigger the full response from the whole alliance. This is deterrence. The purpose is not to provoke conflict, but is to prevent conflict, preserve peace. So this is the way we conduct our dual task. Support Ukraine, of course, also supporting the sanctions uh, on Russia, but then at the same time, uh, stepping up deterrence and defense to ensure no escalation of the conflict. But Security General, so when you look at what kind of security arrangements are needed to secure peace in Ukraine, what do those look like in the next six months? Well, I welcome the fact that allies are uh, discussing with Ukraine how to uh, help them uh, ensure their security. I also welcome, of course, that NATO allies, and NATO is also providing uh, uh, support. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the strongest way of providing support is actually to do what they're asking for, and that is to deliver weapons. Uh, and that's exactly what allies are doing at an unprecedented uh, level. Um, uh, and then the issue of a NATO membership is uh, further down the road. The important thing now is to support Ukraine in the heroic crime uh, fight for, for their freedom, which is also important for our security. Uh, Prime Minister, what do you see as you know, the most important thing in terms of a, a common defense strategy in Europe right now? Well, I think we um, European countries are um, waking up from a certain degree of naiveness that we've had the last decades, thinking that you know, full-scale war on the European continent would never come back, and especially not this type of, uh, this type of war. Um, and, you know, the good thing is that as European countries, we're not alone. I mean, in a moment like this, if you are alone, or you're scared to death, or you're joining, joining NATO, which is what we're seeing with, uh, with Finland and, uh, and Sweden these, these days. So it's good that this is a collective thing, of course, the collective defensive umbrella is something that we also need to contribute to. And uh, all European countries are scaling up uh, in a gradual way their, uh, th their investment. Uh, we in Belgium have decided so a few months ago, we will continue in doing so. What is important to me is that if we invest more in defense, is that to me there are three elements which are important. First element is less fragmentation. Today, European defense is incredibly fragmented, which makes it expensive and not very operational. Second element is more industrial return for European industry. Today, that industrial return is way uh, too low. Third element is more societal return. If we do investments in cybersecurity, it should be for our industry and our population. If we invest in intelligence, it should help us, for example, in counterterrorism. 
if we invest in a well-developed uh, defense, it should be also a way of, uh, of training part of our, uh, of our uh, population. Maybe the last element that I want to put, uh, to put forward is that security is not just defense. We have to have a much more holistic view of this. And why is this holistic view necessary? That's because Vladimir Putin has also a much broader view of destabilizing Europe. He's not only destabilizing Europe just with the war in Ukraine. He's doing it with the war in Ukraine. He's doing it with, with, with um, uh, strategically using his, uh, his energy reserves. He's doing it with disinformation campaigns. He's doing it with um, uh, refugee flows that he's trying to weaponize through, uh, through Belarus. I mean, there's so many tracks that he is using to try to destabilize Europe, which means that if we want to stabilize Europe, we also have to have a much broader view than only the defense part. But the defense part is the most urgent one, then it's good to see that European countries are all stepping up. But President Penderovsky, if we talk about the defense part, it took years for your country to actually accede to NATO. What do you make of the fact that we're now trying to accelerate the accession of two member countries? You know, being, being the, the last entry into the alliance two years now, I know the best, the desires of the Ukrainian people, why they would like to join the alliance. And uh, I wouldn't like to forget, speaking about the NATO membership, the membership in the European Union, they have applied for that recently as well, because these are two corridors, so to say, for the better, more secure and prosperous future. We have been waiting for 21 years to become the member of the Alliance, since becoming the candidate country for membership in 1999, and we have finally succeeded in 2020. And unfortunately, we're still waiting, speaking about the European Union, 17 years with the status of a candidate country for membership. So we should help Ukraine to persuade other allies, which might be skeptical, I'm not speaking only about our allies in NATO, but in the European Union as well, that both gates of these both organizations should stay open for those people, for this country, because they are not fighting only for their freedom, in the first place, of course, but they are fighting. This is the war of one autocracy towards democracy. They are fighting for the democratic values for all of us. And if Putin somehow succeeds in winning this war, then it's not gonna be only Ukraine. So a few days ago, I have sent a letter to President Zelensky uh, saying that we are doing everything we can as a small country. Do not forget that North Macedonia is 1.8 million inhabitants. We have a military budget of only 171 million euros, but we are helping Ukraine as much as we can from the military hardware to the, to the diplomatic support throughout the international forum. So I sent to him that we are gonna speak with our partners, with both organizations, that Gates, should stay open, as I said. The open door policy is not, should not apply only for the NATO alliance, but for the European Union as well. Otherwise, the concept uh, to have the United Europe to be at peace with itself and with the world, from the Atlantic to the Euro, will be only a dream. Mr. Olengren, how much money, how much funding do we need actually to secure Europe? And how much can your country and allies keep on sending to Ukraine in terms of weapons? Well, in terms of weapons, I think we yesterday we had a meeting with the, in the Rammstein format, so that was 40 plus countries that coordinate their efforts uh, to help Ukraine with, with the weapons they need. Our Ukraine is very good at articulating very precisely what is needed. And I think we are now also much better coordinating amongst ourselves uh, in a way that we can actually provide, provide what they need. If we can do, not do it ourselves as the Netherlands, we can join forces with Germany uh, or with other countries. Uh, and by in that way, provide them with really uh, complex, advanced weapons systems that is very much needed in the war itself. But also, as the representative of, of Ukraine just said, also because Ukraine now has to sort of backfill their own uh, military equipment because they also used old Soviet Russian equipment. They can, of course, not replace it by Russian equipment. So they have to get uh, stuff from, from our countries uh, also to build on their military infrastructure. So that's really costly. Uh, and at the same time, we're also increasing in the Netherlands and other countries our own uh, defense budgets, uh, of course, because we have to be stronger on the eastern flank of uh, the alliance. Uh, we really want to step up our efforts to be ready also for the future. But one warning, I mean, if we all are going to spend more, but going to spend it separately, then only the costs are going to go up. Uh, and then we will not increase our own security. So we really have to work on that. We have to coordinate better. We have to find ways for standardization, for interoperability uh, of our systems. 
uh, and for joint procurement uh, in ways that countries are already experimenting with now, the Netherlands with Belgium, for instance. Uh, but we have to, to step it up because otherwise we will keep fragmented armies uh, in national countries instead of a very strong NATO army and also uh, a European defense that can step, uh, step up when necessary in Europe. Premier, what happens though if the war lasts years? Well, then, first of all, I hope not, of course. But if it lasts years, we'll continue support for years. I mean, we have to be very clear on, uh, on, on this. We're supporting Ukraine in this, and we will continue supporting with what is necessary, with equipment, talked about, with information as well, because in a war situation like this, information intelligence, of course, is extremely, uh, extremely important. And we, as European countries, will continue improving the equipment that we have. And I think indeed, as, as, as uh, Kasia said, I think it's important that we do it in an intelligent way, in a planned way, less fragmentation, as I, uh, as I said. This is about how much we invest and how much is important, but how we do it is equally important. And, and if I see in some of the investment plans of some European countries, which are very aggressive investment plans, Let's coordinate. Let's really sit together and let's see who is doing what, what are we buying, how can we standardize. I mean, what we need to do as a European Union is to do a gap analysis ourselves yeah. and to see, okay, what weapon systems do we need? How do we develop them together? Together with the Netherlands, we do this for our naval efforts. We develop together the battleships that we need. It's good that Belgium and Netherlands is doing it, but honestly, we should be doing this together with many, many uh, countries. And this is not just ramping up investment because of Ukraine war. This is a long-term effort that we are putting forward for the next decades. If we do it for the next decades, let's please do it in a coordinated way so that we become more efficient. Because, I mean, if you look at the total defense budget of European countries and compare it to Russia, actually, our budget is much higher. But it's much too fragmented if you compare it to the way Russia is organized uh, today. The president, then I want to ask you... Only one, if I may, only yeah. one sentence plus. Uh, of course, I wouldn't like to criticize my friends because we are in the part of the same alliance. But please, that joint procurement system, which has a big flaws from times to times and weaknesses, should be improved in the future. In my view, that should be the task, main task of all of us, to coordinate, to have the better procurement system, but in the years to come. Now, give the Ukrainians on the bilateral basis, whatever they want, because this is a critical period of the war. In my view, then, following what the NATO experts and all of the military security experts would say to, say, are saying to us, in this period of the time, is probably a very decisive period for the, for the rest of the war, whatever it might last. So this is very important. Give them now, on the bilateral basis, we are giving them, of course, everything they want, but give them more, and these questions this coordination among joint procurement systems, that's a hot topic always, and being for years and years in the alliance, within the alliance, not to waste time and resources and to have duplicity in that process. But now it's critically important to help Ukrainians today, not tomorrow. Yeah, so this is a kind of timeline. I just want to spend a couple of minutes with Secretary General because I know you spoke to the President of Turkey over the weekend over his concerns about Sweden and Finland actually um, accessing NATO. What does he want in return? Well, uh, in my conversation with President Adrian, he expressed uh, many of the same uh, concerns that uh, he has expressed uh, publicly, and that's about uh, terrorism. Uh, it's about their, uh, their concerns about the PKK, uh, uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, the need for Turkey to be able to acquire the uh, weapons they, uh, they deem that they uh, need. Um, let, but let me start by saying that the fact that Finland and Sweden applies for NATO membership, that is historic. Very few people, if anyone, expected that as late as uh, the beginning of, uh, of February. And now they are applying. Uh, and, um, and that demonstrates a very important thing. And that is that when President Putin tried to close the door to NATO, then actually Finland and Sweden decided to move in. Because as late as in December this year, the President Putin proposed a legally binding treaty for NATO, which actually was going to re-establish spheres of influence, where big powers like Russia could decide what smaller neighbors could do or not do. Because in that treaty, it was stated clearly 
that there was no more NATO enlargement whatsoever. NATO had withdrawn all its troops from those allies that had joined after the end of the Cold War, introducing the kind of A and B uh, membership, first and second class uh, membership. And then, of course, he wanted less NATO military presence on his borders. He's getting the opposite. He's getting more NATO presence on his borders, more troops, more forces, and then there will be more NATO members. And I think that's a very strong answer to a president that really tries to reshape the European security architecture by using force and intimidation. And the response is, no, we will not bow to that. Um, then, of course, as when there are concerns, as expressed by, by Turkey, we sit down, yeah. as we always do when there are differences in NATO, and then we find a way out. I cannot tell you exactly how and when, but, but be confident <laughs> we are working on the issue. And, uh, and we have solved the problems before in this, uh, uh, this uh, alliance. Yeah. All allies, also Turkey, agree that uh, NATO enlargement has been a great success, helped to stabilize uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and, uh, and we also realize that, uh, how uh, Finnish and Swedish membership will strengthen NATO, will strengthen the transatlantic bond, uh, and also uh, uh, not least be of great importance for the Baltic region. So. Uh, uh, oh, I'm confident that we will address those issues. Quickly, you have been confident in the past that actually this can be resolved quite quickly. But if you look at some of the weapon export controls, <clears throat> they cannot be lifted overnight. No, but I, I, I still uh, hope and work for a quick solution. Um, uh, but let me also add that I think a part of this solution is, is also to recognize that despite the fact that there are different views uh, within uh, NATO and among NATO allies on issues related to Turkey, um, we also have to recognize that Turkey is an important ally. Uh, Turkey is the ally that has suffered the most terrorist attacks, far more than any other NATO allied country. And Turkey is key just because of its geographic strategic location, bordering Iraq and Syria. The fight against ISIS has been totally dependent on using facilities in Turkey. And of course, when you look at the war in Ukraine, the Black Sea, you realize the importance of Turkey. So I'm not saying that, that, that there are not these differences within the alliance on issues related to Turkey, on, on, on the freedom of press and other things, but I'm only saying that we need to understand that the reason why we need to solve this issue, the concerns that Turkey has put forward, is that Turkey matters for the whole alliance. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are working hard on this. Yeah, look, I, I think the, the question that is at hand here is, do we believe Europe will be more secured if Sweden and Finland join NATO? I think yes. There's absolutely no doubt to that. OK, so Europe will be more secure when both of them join. If that's the main goal, <coughs> then let's talk with, with Turkey and let's, let's solve the issues that they have. But we as 30 countries and now 32, the main goal we have is stabilizing, stabilizing <coughs> Europe. And we will be better off 32 than 30. So, I honestly would be very surprised that things would be put on the table which are unsolvable, knowing what the goal is that we have in front of us. Minister, you agree with that? Absolutely. I think NATO will be stronger with Finland and Sweden in. I think they were already partner countries, member of the European Union. Uh, we, had, we have military cooperation with these countries, also with the northern part of Europe in the Joint Expeditionary Force. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as the Secretary General says, uh, of course, there can always be issues and issues must be raised. There is room for talking about specific issues that countries have. But in the light of the situation that we're in now, I think we have to have the confidence that Secretary General and others will be able to solve this issue. If we're talking, I mean, have they asked you to actually lift some of the exports? bans on weapons? Is it something that your country We, would we also, we have bilateral talks with, with Turkey uh, on a very regular basis. Uh, I think these talks are, are good. We take each other <coughs> seriously and we try to find solutions that are acceptable. Yeah, uh, just a few technical elements because we have been, as I said, last entry and <laughs> Secretary General knows the best that procedure, but without the political agreement and full consensus among all of 30 members of the alliance, there is no way forward. If that political disputes with Sweden, between Sweden and, and Finland and Turkey on the other side is resolved today, hopefully, as soon as possible, but let's say today, uh, this procedure for ratification of that protocol should go into all of these 30 parliaments of the nation states. In our case, it took 20 months, but a half of that time was during the pandemic. But I cannot remember that anybody has entered the alliance without having the political disputes prior to that moment. Uh, quicker than 12 months. 
only for the ratification process in all of the parliaments of the member states. Prime Minister, what can Europe actually do to not double up on NATO, but also secure as European Union? I mean, also given the fact that the funds are limited, we've just gone through COVID, so there's been a lot of fiscal spending, and debt is mounting. That's true. I mean, a lot of things have changed for um, the fact that population looks much more towards the public or, or public service or government in, in, in solving all the big things we're, uh, we're confronted with. Now, first of all, on not doubling up. I know that there's this discussion if, if Europe has a stronger integration from a defense perspective, is that to the de detriment of NATO? Not at all, not at all. I think NATO will be way stronger if we as European countries pull our weight. And NATO will be more stable with two stable legs, which is one North American one and one European one. Honestly, I'm not afraid of that uh, at, at all. Um, what is important is that if we do these military investments, is that the return of those investments is as high as possible. As I said before, industrial and economic return should be way higher. Societal return should be way higher, with also a component in basically also dealing with climate change. I mean, we will be confronted with the impacts of climate change in the years to come in a much more drastic way. Actually, some of the defense uh, investments could, could help with, uh, uh, with, uh, with this. And yes, the pandemic has shown us that the bar is being put much higher on the expectations that the public has, and we have to invest in, in, uh, in, in, in climate change. Okay, how I see it as a government leader is the bar is being put higher, which means that we have to be on the top of our toes, and it's at moment of crisis that we move forward. It's this moment of crisis that as a European Union, we take steps forward, and honestly, what I see now is that as European Union, we used to move forward because we had some <coughs> visionary leaders with great ideas and they pulled the European public forward. Now this has changed. It's actually the European public that looks at us and that says, please, for those big challenges, we know that the nation state on its own cannot do it. Please do it as European Union. Healthcare was not exactly European competence. Energy isn't really as well and defense isn't really either. The public demands from us more integration. And yes, so there's more demands of how much we should do, but if we do it as an in an integrated way, we can do it in a more efficient way, and we can do more. The Minister, and then I have many questions for you, Secretary General, also from the audience, so I'll get to that in a second. Just, just briefly, I think, uh, yes, we are increasing our budgets for defense, and that is also, you have to prioritize. We cannot, we cannot do everything at the same time. Uh, but I think we're, it's not only about defense, that's not only about having military at our borders, it's also about our freedom, it's about rule of law, it's about democracy, it's what, what we all stand for. So that, that's why I think we all feel it's important to do it, but to do it in a smart way, uh, as Prime Minister of Belgium has just stated, and I think also you have to look at the future, so at the same time, with climate change, with the importance of having a, a well-educated uh, population in our countries. Uh, these are the choices that you have to make, and sometimes it means raising taxes, being smart, <coughs> because we also have our budgetary rules, uh, and they apply to all of us, in the European Union, at least. Thank you. I have many questions for the Secretary General, so we'll start off a, a bit rapid fire. Th this one is, is it time now for a naval coalition of NATO states to secure a free and open Black Sea by escorting vessels from Odessa to supply grain to the Global South? It's uh, first and foremost time for uh, President Putin to lift the blockade of Odessa and other Ukrainian uh, uh, ports to allow uh, grain to be exported out of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. Because this is really his responsibility. The war is causing uh, the food uh, shortage and the increasing prices. It's not uh, NATO or EU sanctions. It's actually the direct consequence of the war and the Russian blockade. Uh, then I welcome efforts by EU, by, by NATO member states and others to try to find a way to get more grain out of Ukraine uh, by rail, on land, and also the efforts that are uh, addressing uh, is it possible to get it out uh, uh, on ships. That is a difficult task, it's not an easy way forward. The best and easiest way is to end the war, uh, to drop the blockade and let the, the food uh, go out. Let me add one more thing. And this, this is a war in Ukraine that affects the whole of Europe, but that it has global consequences. The increasing energy prices, energy uh, and food prices, affects everyone and the poorest people of the world. It just makes the whole uh, war, the, the Russian invasion, even more senseless. 
Another question for you. Is the best way to prevent a NATO-Russia war to ensure Russia is defeated, or is it to ensure that Russia has an off-ramp? So diplomatic negotiations, or are we beyond that? I think the best way to prevent this from escalating, again, it's for Putin to stop the war. If that's not the case, then the best way to, to, to act is, 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 is for us to be very firm, to, to make it to make it absolutely sure that he, he, he there's no room to believe uh, that that he can attack any NATO allied country without the full response from the alliance. Because as long as that's clear, there will be no attack. Because NATO is by far the strongest military alliance in the world. 50% of the world's military might and 50% of the world's uh, economic might. So, so NATO solidarity and also demonstrated by increased presence. The reason why we have now uh, roughly 30,000 more U.S. troops uh, in Europe over the last three months is to demonstrate exactly that NATO solidarity. So, so that will not win the war in Ukraine, but that will uh, prevent it from escalating into NATO territory. Mm -hmm. uh, then we need to support Ukraine to help them reach a result on the battlefield that makes it possible for them to agree on the negotiating table. This war will most likely end at the negotiating table. The question is how and when. And therefore, we know that uh, uh, for Ukraine to reach an acceptable result at the negotiating table, they need to be strong at the battlefield. And that's the reason why it's not either support the military or be in favor of a negotiated solution. A negotiated solution, which is possible to accept for Ukraine, will only be achieved if they have a strong military position on the battlefield. Uh, President, maybe this one is for you. The former UK Secretary, Foreign Secretary, um, Haig of the UK, wrote in the Times today that Putin may attempt to divide NATO by calling ceasefire that Ukraine cannot agree to. Would NATO remain alive? Do you want to I take, mean, yeah? No, I agree fully with that. But uh, up to now, we have not showing any signs, even the little one, that we are divided. This was, as Secretary General knows the best, we have shown the unprecedented unity, not in recent times, in NATO history, probably. So, but I would like to send a message to everybody speaking about this subject, these days. What is at stake in Ukraine? First of all, defending the, European, the, the Ukrainian territory, defending the Ukrainian children and the whole people. But we should send, we should help, first of all, Ukrainians to defend themselves, but we should send the message to all the prospective autocrats that democracy will always prevail over dictatorships <clears throat> and that we would like to live in the democratic world. Minister? Well, I can only agree, not, of, course. of course, with that. But, yes. but it, it could be much more of a challenge than, than we're talking about here, if, if this drags on again for years. Yes, it's very, it's very difficult to predict this, of course. Uh, none of us uh, know exactly what is going uh, to happen. But this one of the scenarios that we have to take very seriously is that this can go on for years. And I think it's very important to point out that uh, it is for Ukraine uh, to decide whether a ceasefire or even a peace is acceptable, if the terms are acceptable. Uh, and I also agree, until then, we must do everything we can to support Ukraine with weapons, with training, uh, with our, our partnership that we can give them. And, and one thing I'd like to mention, because it's, uh, what's also important, is every day the price for Putin and for the Kremlin is going up. The sanctions are hurting them. Uh, and we have to push that even further, I think. Uh, and and to, to make them pay for this war uh, in, in every way that, that we can. Uh, and that, that also helps Ukraine, of course. It's the other side, the more economical side, but it's very important. Prime Minister? Yeah, I, I, actually, I think you just said it. I think, don't forget the sanctions. I mean, the impact of the sanctions is really, it's a, it's, it's a thorough impact. Uh, the six packages there is going to go much, uh, much further. And then besides the sanctions, all European countries are making irreversible choices related to energy supply. And the impact of that takes time. But in the years to come, this is going to have a profound impact on the exchange with, uh, with Russia. And it's really hurting the Russian financial capability to continue financing this war. Don't underestimate, besides the packages, what we are doing in energy and all European countries are making choices which are not going to be turned back. I think one of the lessons we have learned during this crisis is that uh, long-term security interests are more important than uh, short-term economic interests. 
to be too dependent on uh, Russian gas is dangerous. That's the brutal reality. It has a price uh, to wean off uh, Russian gas, but we have to do it. Uh, and therefore, uh, I, I support free trade. I believe in a more globalized economy. But when we need to choose between protecting our values or profits, we need to choose protecting our values. If we need to choose uh, uh, between uh, long-term security interests and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the economic gains, then of course, again, we need to, uh, to, to choose economic uh, interest. This is about energy, it's about technology, and it's about also controlling critical infrastructure in Europe. So this is a hard lesson learned. Uh, it has a price, uh, uh, but I think that's uh, quite obvious in light of what we've seen in the last uh, weeks uh, after the invasion of Ukraine. We're almost out of time, so I'm going to ask you each for about 30 seconds, actually, to, to give one or two priorities for what we need to do to achieve peace and security. Mr. Yermak, let me start off with you, because you're still there joining us from Kyiv. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, yeah. please? Because the question was, is, yeah. is in the very short term, apart from the weapons and the support, what do we need to make sure that there's peace and security in this region in the longer term? Uh, thank you for, the, for your questions. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I'd like to say um, that I'm very attentively listening to all your comments uh, of uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for your support, Ukraine, uh, in this war. It's a very important to understand that this war is continuing. And uh, every day, Ukraine uh, continues fighting, but we are continue lost our people. And of course, as soon as possible, we need to receive all necessary weapons. Because I'd like to say that as long as this war is continued, it's uh, started to be more higher the risk that uh, some in other countries, especially which have the borders with uh, Russia, will be involved. And in this country, it uh, is country as the members of the NATO. It means that if we receive everything, which absolutely uh, you say that in all capitals, in our friends and our partners exactly know that we need, we will win. We stop this war in central of the Europe. As we are talking for the long uh, perspective, I explain in my speech that we are proposed and we are now in the consultation of the, first of all, of the security of the guarantees uh, uh, for Ukraine. But we think that after this war, we can't say about strong system of the security in the Europe. It's necessary to build this system. Because uh, till this war is continue, not any countries in Europe can feel safe. And uh, we are a lot of times talk about it. A lot of uh, uh, conversation was before this war, but it's happened. Most bad things happen. happened in the center of the Europe. It's mean that it's time to think in together and to build new strong system, which will be protect any potential aggression, any potential uh, violation of the international law, violation of the territorial integrity of the European countries. Thank you so much, sir. In 20 seconds, President Panarovsky, how do we achieve peace in, and security? In 20 seconds, uh, some people are, dubbing the, uh, are naming this period of the time as a second Cold War. What is important, let's agree with that, but what is important to remember, what is the main difference? The previous Cold War was about ideology. This is not anymore the battle between communism and capitalism. 
We are speaking here, it's clear at least to me, that this is the battle between democracy, democracy throughout the world, and autocratic leaders. And I not even dare to think, to imagine the world, if we are pressed to live in a world where the autocracy rules. It's gonna be a, a, the most dangerous place to be, to be, to live, and certainly not the prosperous place the next generation would like, would like to, take, to take part. Thank you, Minister. I think from the beginning we've said unity is our strongest weapon, so we have to stay united. If we stay united, I'm confident we can keep on helping Ukraine with the weapons, uh, humanitarian aid, financial aid, everything they need. And the second thing I'd like to say, I think this has been a, a wake-up call for the European Union in, in a geopolitical sense. And I think we have to use that momentum to build on a stronger European defense within NATO and within the European Union. Secretary General. Well, my main message is that uh, the Ukrainian war has reminded us of the importance of North America and Europe standing together. I don't believe in uh, America alone, I don't believe in Europe alone, but I believe in uh, North America and Europe uh, together. And, uh, and NATO is the institutionalized uh, expression of uh, that uh, unity. Two world wars and the Cold War taught us that we are uh, uh, not safe when we are divided. We are safe when we stand together. Mm. Um, ensure the support of our domestic population. I think we are in for a somewhat longer period of instability, um, which means that we need to make sure that our North American European populations are supporting us, which means that we need to protect them for the impact of what is happening. If we don't protect them well, we might lose domestic support and it might become much harder. Thank you so much for this important conversation. Really. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.